Hey, 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 hey. Welcome back to Disco Elysium. Uh, last time we left off, we were doing a bunch of side quests. And... There's not a whole lot more I can do, so... I'm gonna go pursue at least a little bit of the main quest because it's still pretty early in the day and I don't want to get too far behind on police work so I'm gonna go on in here and talk to these guys let me handle this the woman says to the crowd in the mess hall before turning to you you are far from home officer this isn't a district known for its love of self-proclaimed militiamen. Uh, we've already talked before. Didn't we? Is, isn't she the lady from, like, right out there? Uh, you're not a gardener. That's right. I'm not a gardener. I'm a legal counselor for the Dock Workers Union. Feels like she's waiting for a reaction of some sort. I mean no trouble, I'm here to do my job, that's all. Not a muscle moves in her face, but her eyes trace yours, stern and perceptive. You are looking for Titus Hardy, who you think has information on the murder the RCM is investigating. You want to interview him? She points to the man standing in the middle of the room. That's Titus. Talk to him. But know this. I'll be keeping an eye on you. No strong arming, nothing official. The district of Martinez does not recognize your authority to make arrests. All right, well, could this be the Miss Beaufort that Easy Leo mentioned? The one Mr. Uh, Everett sent to law school, Beaufort. Um, are you Lizzie Elizabeth Miss Beaufort? I suggest not wasting time on trivial pleasantries and focus, focusing on why you are actually here. Titus Hardy, he po she points to the tall man by the table. Even though she has excellent control over herself, something moved behind her eyes. The way she stands, in her face. You caught her off guard. Push her some more. Easy Leo told me about you. He likes to talk a lot. You're not here to chat up the legal counsel. You're here to question these men. You set the pace and the topic of these conversations here. Establish that. He said Mr. Everett sent you to law school. I represent the union and these men here. She points to the crew around the table. Don't make this personal. A very minor victory. Uh, what's your role in all this? Like I told you. Uh, like I already told you. I'm a legal counselor. She crosses her arms. Do you have hearing problems? No. What if I want to talk to you, not Titus? What you want is of no significance, officer. Don't test your authority. In Martin A, you are no one. What are you going to do to me? What are we going to do to you? She starts laughing. It's a cold laughter, devoid of joy. The union isn't going to do anything to you. It's not a crime syndicate. It's a labor organization. Mm-hmm. A gruff hump from the table. Goddamn right it is anything it is the rcm who do things to people she shakes her head but we digress why are you so aggressive i'm being aggressive she raises her eyebrows listen you moral intern lackey you're part of a mob enforcing the unlawful privatization of revitual 20 fat men in the occident are stealing it all and you are their bodyguard fuck yeah the tall broad-shouldered man takes a sip of his beer so ask what you came to ask, or get back to your commanders. Hmm. I like that. Good start. Let's take it a step further. Armed uprising. What are the Union's plans? Look, a comedian. Her expression stiffens. Do your job, ask your questions, then get out of Martinet. Strange. It's as if people don't believe a cop could be a socialist revolutionary. <laughs> I should talk to Titus then. 
this is what I study law for. This is where you say your bit. Broad-shouldered man points at you with a beer can. Don't say anything yet. Hey, 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 dipshit. You hard of hearing or something? The boss man's talking to you. We need to talk about the man hanged out oh, back. Oh, this is about him? A real looker, that one. You sure took your time, huh? Waited for him to get all ripe and pretty for you. Oh, he was a real pretty boy. Hanging up there, letting out that pretty boy smell. I can't for the life of me understand why you did it. I mean, I would have just left him up there. You must really like cleaning up other people's shit. Why is this guy so loud? You might want to start asking your questions now. It's not going to get better than this. Scan the room. No, no, no. He points at himself. Eyes here. You got business with my boys. You got business with me. He understood what you were doing. Taking inventory of them. Yeah, you fuck with the Hardy boys. You fuck with Titus Hardy. Shouts the scrawny rat face man. Two teeth missing in the front. Relax, Dennis. No one is fucking you yet, says the 40-something man from the corner with a plectrum hanging from his neck. Yeah, Dennis, calm down. A blonde man in his 30, 30s agrees. No one's fucking you, you stupid fuck. Let Dennis enjoy his fucking man. Enjoy his fucking man. We don't mind. You notice gang tattoos. The man must either be Mesk or Saramirizian. Yeah, the fat guy in the middle lets out a little chuckle. You're not even being fucked, Dennis. Easy, fellas. We got company. Titus puts an end to it. Let's see what brings the cop around. Too late. You already scanned the room. You got a pretty good picture. A picture of what? Of the actors here. You could take another look at the tracks in the mud on the crime scene compared to these guys. True. I talked to Joyce, the merc you hanged. His friends are coming for you. Do I just blatantly do it that aggressively, or do I... The man hanged in the backyard. Did you do it? The pretty boy? He takes a sip from his can. You really love talking about him. Evidence. Show them you have it. It doesn't have to be conclusive. Why is there a container belt around the dead man's neck? container belt like we use in the harbor yes why because we took it he says from the harbor where we work then we went out back and used it to hang him we did this he looks at you dead in the eye together all of us until he was dead that's why there's a container belt around his neck aha so you just confessed to murder goddamn right I No, the woman interjects. These seven honest men have equally come forth. They told you what happened so that you don't waste any more of your time. You murdered him just like that. No remorse. How many people have you sent to the chase? Ever felt remorse for them? Or sent them to reunion to rot for 20 years for life? He says it as if it were worse than dying. What I do is different. I enforce the law. You just kill people like it's nothing. But you see, a law, law man, he says, squeezing his beer can, is something people agree upon. And here in Martin A, we agreed that this man had to die. Who called the shots that night? Are you deaf? There will be no singling anyone out. You can't arrest a hardy boy without arresting all hardy boys. A shadow of a smirk passes her lips as she tilts her head. Do you think you could do that? Do you think you could arrest all of them? No, but seriously, who calls the shots around here? Who do you fucking think does? He sounds more amused than angry. You do. Point at Elizabeth. I thought she did. If he's amused at it, He's more amused than angry. I wonder if I could get to him by claiming that somebody else does. Hmm. Elizabeth. It wasn't a question, dickwad. How fucking stupid are you? 
This asshole is worse than he falls silent. Titus runs the Hardy Boys genius. That's why we're called the Hardy Boys. Ain't that right, fellas? Titus grins. I think you got your answer, Mr. Law. Yes, there are some administrative differences. She gives Titus a stern look. But on that night, they all acted as one man. When did this hanging incident occur? You don't have to keep answering his questions. The fixer turns to remind Titus. I know, Lizzie. Relax. He takes a sip. We killed him last Sunday night. Seemed like a good way to end the week. How long had you known the victim? Known him? We don't associate with scum like that, asshole. Yeah, who do you think we are? Quiet. Titus gives Glenn a stern look. Uh, he comes around about three weeks ago when that Pines cow first sailed into town. Happy. Sorry, just a second. By the Pines cow, you mean Joyce, the negotiator for Wild Pines? No, he stresses. I mean the Pines cow, the stupid-ass cow they sent in to fuck us over. But you know what? He rubs his chin, pretending to mull it over. Why don't you ask her about the pretty boy? I'm sure she has interesting things to say when you ask her hard enough. That's enough insinuation for today, Titus. She turns to you. Officer, your interview is drawing to an end. Don't waste your last questions. Why did you kill him? Why? He hisses through his teeth. Because he was a worthless mercenary scum, and he stepped out of line in my town. So he was a mercenary. That's it. And he stepped out of line. He repeats, draw clamp, sh clamp shut like a vice. What kind of mercenary? The kind that shows up when you start a strike. The experienced kind, too. Had Kohoi and Simonin written all over him. Ex Oranhi Special Forces. A live grenade. The man spreads his arms right here in our bar. This one has a special gripe with him coming here. I can't prove it, but I know he was sent by the Wild Pines. They hire merc shit like that. Story of every strike from here to Samara. Hold on, how do you even know he was in Special Forces? Because one night, he walked straight up to the mic and said, I'm around, he's goddamn Special Forces, and I'm gonna fuck you all. Really? Yeah, really. Had a gin and tonic up there, sang some around, he paratrooper song, then said he's gonna fuck everyone. We couldn't believe it either. But he fucking did, right there. He points at the stage like some kind of animal. This is a serious violation of the karaoke code. Yes, it is. Right. But what did he actually do wrong? Wrong, he roars. He harassed women, raped one, harassed workers, threatened to kill some as a warning. He whipped spittle from his mouth. There's slight unease in him suddenly. He regrets mentioning the rape to kill us all if we don't open the gates, if we don't let the scabs in, if we don't bend over. He cracks his knuckles, and that was before he started coming here. Yeah, he said it was his favorite joint now, started coming here every night, drinking, grabbing girls, grabbing one of ours mid-karaoke, right there on the stage. He grabbed someone? Yeah, this girl's on the mic, a beautiful girl, young, young. gets into the second verse of Lover Lake, the fucker grabs her legs, starts screaming. Show me your cunt. Why don't you show me your cunt? Then he knocks. He gets knocked on the head with a wine bottle. Doesn't even fall down. He shakes his head in disbelief. Was this the same girl who was sexually assaulted? Raped, he said. Aren't you fucking listening? My man is talking to you. He took care of it. They got the girl out before anything else could happen. That's good. Yeah, me and Eugene got her out. Aren't you fucking listening? He repeats like a parrot. Right, but who did he rape then? This is a very serious allegation. No, there's a moment of silence. You're not getting a name. That's a Martinet matter, and I'm not discussing it with you clowns. How did you kill him? We hanged him up by his neck until he got real still. Wasn't that obvious, copper? Didn't they teach you anything at the cop school, idiot? The autopsy revealed the victim's hands were not tied. No signs of struggle. How do you explain that? Uh, we, uh... He looks even more irritated than before. Look, I'm not going to play 20 questions with you, Capo. I'll say it again. We killed him. Yeah, I knocked him out. The tattoo one sp speaks up, banging on his chest. Came up behind him and clubbed him in the back of the head. He went down like a sack of sand. 
That's right, Lawman. He spits through his teeth. Then we hang the fuck. Make them a bit more uncomfortable first, then see if it all adds up. Mr. Tats, what did you use to knock the victim out? My fucking elbow, copper. He looks you straight in the eye. S Samaran boxing style. Where did all this action take place? Right fucking here. He spreads his hands. Eugene already told you that the fuck had started coming to our bar. Yeah, man, weren't you listening? Um, things aren't quite right here, are they? Fuck. Actually, they're admirably, surprisingly composed. The entire room, given, given how many questions you've lobbed their way. All of them? Maybe one of them is fidgeting, cracking under the pressure. Well, this one, but he's always fidgeting, so don't get your hopes up. Right, I have other questions about the lynching. Like what, copper? So what are we going to do now? Nothing, her reply comes sharp. Your investigation here is done. You should go back to Jamrock, to your station, where you belong. Yes, run home, lonely rent-a-cop. He grabs another beer. Real law officials are done with you. You're the lucky you didn't get a beating. Forget about their games. You've mapped out the characters. Reading the footprints in the yard should be easier now. Uh, again, just the dead guy's autograph since you're his biggest fan. About fucking time. Um, I talked to Joyce, the merc you hanged. His friends are coming for you. Yeah? He doesn't seem worried. By friends, you mean his squad mates from Cornell? Wouldn't want to beat up his grandma. They're snickering in the room. Some of the men put their beers down. Yes, they're forming some kind of tribunal, and they're coming for you. Let them come, Blondie yells across the cafeteria. The Hardy Boys are right fucking here. You heard the man, right here. He points to the ground. We're armed. We got the whole district behind us, and Glenn. Glenn is fucking crazy. Yeah, a well-oiled murder machine. He punches Blondie on the shoulder. The mercenaries are armed with automatic weapons. We got weapons of our own. Cracks open his vest to give you a glimpse of his holster. We got Eister 50s, Zillaggers. Glenn's got a knock cannon at home. Will they pe pierce ceramic armor? I guess we're going to see, aren't we? See what? That they don't? Yeah, like you've been up against ceramic armor. He takes a sip of beer to be bide his time, then tries to get the last word in. You haven't seen the whole... You haven't even seen the whole suit, right? I've seen the whole fucking thing, and it didn't make him immortal. This colonel is bad news, you know that, right? Pfft, spray a beer. So with the local gangs, the fucking Barmy ar Army, and the Madre Scum. You've been out there, seen any around? Yeah, where are they now, huh? He points south. Sent back to Madre in an airtight cargo crate. Joyce said they've gone rogue. Nobody's controlling them. Big fucking surprise, he mutters. They hire psycho scum, arm them to the teeth, and let them loose in the city. What do you think is going to happen? Okay. What do you mean, okay? He jerks forward a bit. I mean, okay. I'll be on your side when they come. Yeah, he snorts. Just try not to get in the way when the whoop-ass flies open. Beneath the whoop-assery, it's clear that he appreciates all the help he can get. Um, I can retry it. So, establish authority. Establish authority. Yes, authority. Feverish thoughts race through your mind. Oh, God. I'm the only thing keeping this town from going to hell, and you're not helping. That's it. That's all I got. Did you already try the gun thing? I hear the gun thing is excellent and has great results. You're probably right. The others are only there for filler. To make the gun thing pop. I need Kim and his gun here for my demonstration. The fuck you talking about gun? He asks angrily. No one's going to let you wave a gun around here. The only thing keeping this town from going to hell, and you're not helping. 
point your finger. What exactly... What exactly you've been doing that's so goddamn special? Shitting yourself in front of us? He leans in. Going around, harassing kids on the street? Kids who've done nothing wrong? All the while talking racist shit. Don't think we aren't watching, fascia. People here trust us. We're getting complaints. <laughs> I'm not shitting myself. Uh, I haven't said anything racist. Of course you have. You've been calling people kipped left and right, inciting race violence in my town. Carly said they've been trying to set up a race rally, whatever the fuck that means. Trying to get the kips out of Revitch Hole before the economy goes to shit. Um, that's a lie. There is no race rally. Sure there is. Carly said they're bulk purchasing confetti, ribbons too, and loudspeakers. He shakes his head. The fireworks. Carly works at a carnival shop, you see. Get the fuck out of here, you racist carny. Titus points at the door. There'll be no race rally in my town. What's going on? Are you a racist now? Is the rally real? Please don't set up any rally. It'll make you look awful. I'm gonna take off now. Alright, let's go check out those footprints. Several footprints in the mud left by work boots, anywhere between anywhere from six to twelve pairs have walked here. Sitting at a desk. Oh, I need him here. Shit. Uh well I can't talk to her. Sure wish I could. I guess I could read a book. Yes, certainly. She rubs her hands together. Another good sale. I'm all paid for the night, so. Um. This 20 by 50 centimeter check looks like it's meant to be handed over ceremoniously on a gala like event. It supposedly exchanges for 25 real at your local Fritz store. Below the number, a careful hand has written the words, Constables rent all of it. Note, worthless in a pawn shop. A classic. On the front of peace, an anatomically unrealistic muscleman is reaching into a mountain stream, yearning to touch his glimmering mirror image. His eyes are full of childlike wonder. On the blood-soaked snow right next to him lie two giant Sawai handers. The cover of this tattered paperback features the man from Hilmdal standing atop a pile of bloody corpses. His two Sawai handers are crossed over his massive chest in a dramatic X, their blades dripping with gore. Seems over the top. Behind him rise the harsh, snow-capped peaks of his native Northlands. In bold, red letters, the title Hymdalerman, the man from Hymdal, unfurls like a banner in the foreground. A nearly nude woman lies spread in supplication, her private strategically covered by her flowing black hair. Naked woman and giant swords. Is that really the best they could come up with? Feels formulaic and derivative. Look at the back cover. The back blur breeds. His latest adventure serves as the perfect introduction to the savage Helmdahl saga. Meet man from Helmdahl, his faithful blood brother, Tyrbald, the most noble Rothgar, and some of their most fearsome foes yet for the Northlands, for Helmdahl. Below, in smaller font, you see the parenthetical, adapted from Man from Helmdahl and the Necromancer's Treasure, 
Man from Hjelmdal, Lord of Rothgar, and Man from Hjelmdal, the Curse of Nocterror. A brazen attempt to bilk fans for more money by splicing together old stories under a new title. Uh, the publishers must have a dim view of their readership. Their main concern is the continuation of the franchise, not making literary history. Read the first couple pages. The story opens in media res. The man from Hjelmdal and his band of northern reavers are in the bowels of an ancient temple, surrounded by an army of gibbering whites led by the deathless necromancer. One by one, the brave Northmen fall to the relentless crush of undead, only to join their number as reanimated corpses. By nightfall, only the man from Hjelmdal and his blood brother, Noble Tyrbold, are left standing against the dead horde. It is an honor to die by your side, brother, Tyrbold cries, as his battle axe beheads one of the reanimated one of their reanimated comrades. Wow, they're in trouble now. Nine, Tyrbold, the man from Hjelmdal bellows over the army of flesh and bone, have courage for the no Northlands. For Hjelmdal, he leaps to the mezzanine to face the black-eyed figure, and like a mad ice bear, whirling twin, Zweihanders, Sturm and Drang, he plows through the ranks of the deathless surrounding the necromancer. It is physically impossible for a human being to effectively dual wield Zweihander swords in any kind of real life combat situation. I know, I've played Dark Souls. And with deadly finesse, his twin blades scissor the necromancer's head from its body. The undead legions collapse like ragdolls as the dark magic leaves them and the two Northmen stand alone in the accursed temple where the bodies of the lost brothers litter the floor. Skip ahead. A few chapters later, the man from Hjelmdal and Tyrbol are completely different setting, are in a completely different setting. High above an arid desert, riding a pair of griffins that always seem to reappear at narratively convenient moments. This book makes a mockery of the very idea of good plotting, though something tells you coherence was never the point. The Northmen find themselves in the court of the power of a powerful southern king, Lord Hrothgar. The old king beseeches the man from Hjelmdal to rid his kingdom of the Noctur, a subterranean clan of blind wizards who traded their souls for demonic powers. The man from Hjelmdal extracts a high price from the desperate king. He asks land for the homeless desert pigs living exiled in the kingdom's borderlands. Rothgar offers the hand of his eldest daughter instead, but the son of winter does not budge. Hold on, why is the man from Hjelmdal doing any of this? What do you mean? Why is he doing all this? Because the flame of justice burns bright within his chest. Because above all, he's driven to bring honor to the name of his beloved Hjelmdal. Because his noble Catelyn blood lusts for glory and conquest cannot be denied. Is that all? What do you mean, is that all? Is there anything else to this character? He is the man from Hjelmdal, forged in the fury of battle. Death was his sire and blood his dam. He had but 14 winners when he left his frigid homelands in Catla to seek glory and honor. That is his character. He doesn't even have a real name. What is inside this man? Or is muscle and bone all he is? Okay, but does he have any internal tension? He is the wildest man alive, the only mortal strong enough to wield twin Zweihanders, Sturm and Drang, whose names mean Storm and... Yes, I get that. He's strong and has big swords. But why should I care about his character? What are you, a book critic? I might be. Enough. You're ruining the pacing of the story. Now where did you leave off? Ah, yes. What pacing? You skip past a section detailing an elaborate banquet with many toasts, as well as the long and perilous journey from Hrothgar's keep to the ancient forest of Yezdor, where our heroes inflate the Nocturne's dire hall. In the center of the Great Hall stands a blood altar on which a pair of Nactarar terror are disemboweling a shrieking peasant, an unholy rite that empowers the Nocturar forbidden magic. As the vile ceremony ends, the sound of steel unsheathing draws the Nocturar's attention to a pair of cloaked figures standing in the doorway. Swiftly, the visitors toss off their cloaks and unsheathe glimmering northern steel as the man from Hjelmdal and his valiant blood brother, Tyrbold, well, it, yeah, who else would it be? In an instant, the Nocturne summon a horde of gibbering orcanoids who rush our heroes. The hall fills with the clang of blades and the screams of dying. 
as the floor goes slick with steaming auric mid viscera. Oh, for fuck's sake. When the din of battle settles, only the man from Hillmill and Tyrbald remain standing. Exhausted and dripping with the entrails of their foes, the two Northmen confront the foul Nocturne. The man of Hjelmdal's sort of light blue eyes fill with indescribable fury. For the Northlands, he cries, rushing headlong into a desperate melee. You gotta be kidding me. What? This is almost exactly the same as the first scene. Even the word gibbering is used twice. In the first scene, the man from Hjelmdal fought a powerful necromancer in his army of the dead. Now he's confronting a pair of Nocturne and their horde of Ganoid thralls. The two couldn't be further apart. All right, fine, what happens next? Excellent question. One easily answered by purchasing the next thrilling chapter in the Helm Dollarman saga, Helm Dollarman at the Gates of Tomorrow. The last page of this one merely reads, to be continued. Considering the sheer amount of different Helm Dollarman books out there, it's very unlikely you're ever gonna find the sequel. Uh, the man from Helmdal uh, stares at you on the cover, his face fixed in grim resolve. Put the book away. Well, that was... That was... I'd get another book, I'm but sorry, I'm sorry, sir. I can't talk right now. I'm very busy with my homework. I have so much homework now. You just can't win. Out of the rain and into the gutter. What are you doing now? Math. She looks into her notebook with trepidation really difficult like really they say you need to get it uh, you need it to get rich better than standing outside in the cold I guess suddenly she smiles and perks up remembering something oh oh I found something while you were away what is it Dick Mullen's hat I thought this would fit you she gives you a hat almost exactly like the one Dick Mullen wears on the covers like a thanks for helping out not me the city I mean like a detective does wait where did you get it? Just what Dick Mullen would ask. She lowers her voice. I got it from behind the curtains. I'm not really supposed to go in there. It's a fedora? Maybe. It's the hat Dick Mullen wears all the time. She grins with joy. You'll look way more serious with that. Suddenly, she looks back at the infernal scribblings under her nose. Right, I have to get back to my homework now before Mom notices. Man, this is hard. Alright, bye. See you around. Now, obviously. Yes. Um, let's go ahead and put on this nicer shirt. I really need some better pants. Still working on those. Um, what do I want to level up? Let's go more into Inland Empire. Wait, how many skill points do I have? Oh, I have four. Okay. Level those both up to three. And for the next one, I'll unlock another one of these. Oh, so are these the ones I failed? And these the ones I can try again? Footprints in the dust. White checks are the ones that are damaged ledger. What can I do with that? Can I read the case files now? Yes, at last you find a way to piece them together using the alphanumeric code on the margin. HDB 41. Date of initialization. 
initialization, and time of arrival on the scene, followed by the title. Boop. Weren't those officer precinct? Why, yes, your precinct number is 41. An HDB. Every last alphanumeric in the files begins with it, and these are your case files. It's safe to say HDB are your initials. Harry Dubois. Still feels like there's something missing from that. The Next World Mural. This one is relatively easy to reconstruct. Overnight on 1202, a graffito, nay, a mural, appears on an eight-story tenement overlooking Central Jamrock. The building is sparsely inhabited ghost tower, part of a failed real estate development called Grand Curran. The mural is enormous. Two silhouettes, a man and a woman, are kissing. The text cut into their form reads, True love is possible, only in the next world, for new people. It is too late for us. Wreck havoc on the middle class. People call it that thing and that fucking thing. It's visible for miles. Two days the station's complaint desks get clogged with quests to remove the bummer you and your partner are assigned to the case. The graffito crew is easy to track down. Only the bills, letters, have the literage of industrial paint to cover the surface. One of the excuse me, graffito artists is rumored to be rich. They take responsibility for the execution, but not the design. The ideologue, ideologue of the next world mural, as the crew calls it, remains an unknown. Wait, do I ever find out who came up with... Who came up with... Um, the case files do not show you finding the author of the design. Read on. Crew agrees to clean up after themselves. However, your partner JV is against the removal, citing public transport public support for conservation. This leads to a debate in Precinct 41, which then spreads to the streets of Jamrock, ending in a rare plebiscite, organized by you and the rest of Row 3. The 9,000 people subjected to the mural's message, all of Lakeside, Central Jamrock, and Villobos, plus half of the eminent domain, participate in the vote. Although the case begins with what appears to be a lot of rumbling on the streets as to how juvenile and stupid the mural is, given a choice between the two options. <sighs> Remove the mural. No. Keep the mural. It's right. Staggering 78% of voters choose to keep it. Turns out the opposition were a loud minority and that love truly is possible in the next world for new people, and it is too late for us. All that remains is to wreak havoc on the middle class. In any case, it appears to have been a rare case of civil activity in the quarter, and agreement as well. What do you want to tackle next? Um, let me get a drink of water. Un momento. The Unsolvable Case. AKA Leslie and Burke, AKA the public indecency drunk and the property damage drunk is a cursed case. It's been passed from unsuspecting officer to unsuspecting officer for 10 years. On January 29th, hey, that was a couple days ago. The unsolvable case made its way to you. Why you accepted it is unclear. Every officer, and indeed most civilians in Jamrock, know it's unsolvable. Leslie will always take his pants off when he's drunk. Burke will always trash everything. It's just what they do. It is their nature. You cannot change the nature of a man. You can, can't lock them away. His public indecency and small-scale property damage are not punishable by incarceration. The only way for Leslie to stop displaying his genitals and for Burke to stop attacking things would be for them to stop drinking alcohol, which in their 40s or 50s, it's hard to tell because of their distorted features, is a medical improbability. Couldn't we just keep them off the streets? You would think that, but you're wrong. Where's the fun in exposing your genitals or breaking stuff in your own home? No. Leslie and Burke are on the corner of Main Street and Perdition because that's where the action is. Can you keep yourself off the streets? Proceed. Threatening, fines, dragging them to the station, locking them up in the hell holes they live in, locking them up in the station, hypnotherapy, even trying to get a local gang 
of Zimwakis to take them out. The Zimwakis gave them ethanol so Burke and Leslie would expose and rampage even harder. He tried it all. Still, the complaints wouldn't stop, as they hadn't stopped for ten years. It's plain to see from the files that you, Satellite Officer JV, and Special Consultant TH had more important cases to attend to. You uncovered cro cross-references to several ongoing investigations, each brought to a standstill every time you drive down Main Street, because there they are, on the corner of Perdition. And what is Leslie doing? Oh my god. Oh. Uh, what were their two names? Alright, Leslie displays his genitals. Good, you're learning. If the files are to be trusted, that's all there is to it. That and Burke breaking things. And the fact that you're both they're both drunk. But then again, so are you. The case becomes considerably less comic one day when Burke takes a swing at your ledger. He must have it confused with the property he likes to damage, but the joke's on him. The officer is also drunk. Way more drunk than Burke there. And let's be fair, you also have party eyes. You slam the hardened plastic board in his face, then proceed to beat him unconscious with it. In the process, the ledger sustains damage. The compartment within, reserved for permeable documents, is jammed shut. You stop your assault on the now unconscious Burke to open it, but are unable to do so. The officer began to cry, reports Leslie, who at this point is tending to Burke. He came at us, and at us. I think he was trying to kill Burko. While trying to kill Burko, you slowly come around. The permeable's compartment is open. You've smashed it open on poor Burko's kneecaps. The good news is, Burke can't walk anymore. He can't get out of his apartment. An invalid. With Burke to tend to, Leslie cuts back on the indecent exposure. Maybe he flashes his genitals to Burke. Who knows? But both drunks are off the street. The complaints stop. The unsolvable case is solved. Which is why the officer responsible narrowly escapes a disciplinary heating, hearing. Sorry, The end. Do you want to read another one? Uh, yeah, one second. The square bullet hole murders. It would be very interesting to read about these, wouldn't it? I mean, there seems to be square-shaped entry wound in the victim's forehead. She's been sitting there for weeks on a rocking chair with a square hole in her skull, staring at the wall, her mouth agape. But, but that's all you got. From the half hour you spent piecing it all together, all you know is the entry wound was square-shaped. You never found the bullet, and then another body showed up, also with a squared hole square hole in his forehead. A sequence killer? Who knows? Those pages are missing. What next? Don't worry. One day. One day you may still catch the man with the square gun. <laughs> the couch in an unexpected location. Some assholes brought their couch outside and hung out on it in the middle of the street on the roof on the hillside by the motorway. You know, at an unexpected location. They were young, and they thought they looked cool on it. They looked really cool, like a rock band. Yes, as you've said here, insufferable rock and roll assholes. Young people are the worst. So anyway, you gotta complain about the damn sofa, or couch, or whatever it was. They were leaving it out in all these unexpected and whimsical locations they took it to, where they also took photos of themselves on it, and smoked cigarettes, and drank coffee because they felt it's intellectual. Cigarette butts, coffee cups, stupid couch. You had to clean it all up, and you did, so congratulations to you, case solved. Did I ever catch those guys? No, you didn't have time for that. These notes show that you have what it is called a real goddamn job. You don't have time to be chasing down the couch assholes. You have a real job to do, what's next? Murder at the hookah parlor. Murder. Tam, tam, tam. At the hookah parlor. Was a case originally assigned to an officer called Joseph Mills, who is now dead, of circumstances completely unconnected to murder at the hookah parlor. Wait, how? Beaten to death by a throng of villa, 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 villa,
gang members when him and his partner JM, only initials mentioned, answered a call one night. It's a sad story and it isn't really represented in your case file. Stop stalling and get to the murder at the hookah parlor. Right on. On with the murder. Joseph Mills was on the case that he just couldn't solve. Was doing it solo. Said it was a real nutcracker. A real brain twister. Was on it for like a month. The captain got impatient. Shittered it off the pot, Mills. Mills didn't get off the pot. Not yet. He kept at it for a couple of weeks more. Racking his brains. Running with every theory. As outlandish as it seemed. Still couldn't solve the murder at the hookah parlor. Tough case, he said. Toughest he's ever had. Wait, was Joseph Mills a good cop? No, he was awful. Awful sense of humor, too. The worst jokes you've ever heard. Really rapey. Still, he'd been on it for months now. Said it was the final case. Said it was uncrackable. That the murder vanished into thin air. That goddamn hookah parlor was all he talked about. Go on. Okay, so the case is handled to you, handed to you because Mills isn't getting anywhere. And you look into it. Here's the setup. A young man is found dead in a hookah parlor. You know, whose place is where you go and smoke bubblegum flavored vapor all day. Can you get high off it? No, it's soot and water vapor. It doesn't really do anything. Really stupid. Yeah. So anyway, young man in his 20s found with a skull busted open right on the floor of the hookah parlor in the middle of the day. No one else is there. Is in there. Only client that day. In perfect health, too. Some kind of movie producer. No one enters. No one exits. He's just sucking on his watermelon hookah all morning, all noon, like he usually does. He's a regular. No calls. Nothing. Just sucking on the hookah until 1545. Then bam, he's dead on the floor with his skull busted open, blood everywhere. What happened? How can it be? Mills has no idea. Invisible assassin? Movie deal gone sour? Girl at the counter did it. Nothing fits. Eerie. And just dropped dead. So you go to the parlor. You see cushions around the table. Table's low, heavy, really sharp edge. He sucked hookah, stood up, passed out, hit his head on the table and died. See? You can't even read the thing without solving it. Yeah, it was that. Turns out hookah does do something. It turns off your brain's oxygen supply, and you don't notice it till you have to get up to go to the bathroom. He must have sucked a lot of it. Yeah, he liked his hookah. Steven was his name. What was he doing there for six hours? Smoking hookah, didn't you hear? I don't know. Trying to come up with a movie script, maybe? Anyway, that was murder at the hookah parlor. Joseph Mills wasn't a good detective, and about 30 minutes has passed piecing it together. Next. I can revisit this. Um... Slide the hidden drawer open. Inside, you see two sticky stubs. Fucking kill yourself, you asshole. The words just crossed your mind somehow. Who are they for? Who do you think? Ouch. Alright. Uh, this is easy enough. Go pick up some trash. Ah, oh, cool. August 2nd, early late summer. You're getting off the streetcar in Le Jardin, east of the river. Her father and mother are middle class. The nylon of her little jacket rustles next to you, in the dark, like autumn leaves. Her heels click on the pavement. You're walking up to the gate in front of her parents' house. She takes out her chewing gum, and you kiss her, feeling like electricity flows through your whole body. Immediately, you know that you've entered into a completely different world. Plus two perception. Betrayal lingers everywhere. Cool. something down there. Boy, that helps. The musty smell of a potato cellar in spring emanates from the air vent. 
Oh my god, there's so much trash now that I've got this trash bag. Although I guess I can collect it for money, right? It's all over the place. But how else am I going to afford my books? Sorry, one second. Um, punch clock slash payphone. That was back at that area. Backyard wall, still impossible. Set of tracks, yep. Footprints in the dust. Can't remember where that is. I don't have a copy of the city map. Where can I find that? The convenience store? The pawn shop? Um, I'm going to pause here for a second. And I'll be back in a few moments. Um, thanks for watching.